John chapter number 4. The title of the message is this, The Harvest is Now. The Harvest is Now. We're going to look primarily at verses 28 through 38 this morning. But uh, by way of introduction, I want to look at the beginning of John 4. And if you look at verse, uh, verse 3, it says, He left, speaking of Jesus, He left Judea, departed again into Galilee, and He must needs go through Samaria. Now let me remind you that Samaria was an area most Jews wouldn't want to go to. Uh, Samaritans uh, were, were called dogs by the Jews. That doesn't make it right, but that's just the way it was. The Jews looked at Samaritans as half-breeds, and they called them dogs, and the Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans hated the Jews. And uh, let me say this. Uh, it may be that, that uh, there are folks here, maybe you've been raised this way, that you were raised with a little bit of a, 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 a bend or a, 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 a hatred towards somebody because of the color of their skin. Let me just say, that's sin. That's wrong. Uh, we are all of one blood, the Bible says. And we all came uh, from the same source. We all are creations of God. And so, uh, you say, but that's how I was raised. Well, we weren't all raised right all the time, were we? Uh, did you ever grow up and find there were some things maybe that... that you needed to, to, to change even though you've been raised a certain way. Uh, no parents are perfect. And so I'm just saying, uh, it's not right to say, boy, I don't like so-and-so, I don't like this group because they're this color, because they're from this area. Uh, the fact is that we're all of one blood, we're all Amen. souls for whom Jesus Christ died. Amen. And we all matter to God. And we're all valuable to God. Uh, there's not one person in this room any less valuable or more, more valuable than any one of those children uh, that we bring in on the buses that are in children's church right now. We are valuable to God. They are valuable to God. And here Jesus is going through Samaria, verse 5, this area that Jews wouldn't normally go through. Then cometh He to a city of Samaria which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being wearied with His journey sat thus on the well. It was about the sixth hour. So it was about noon. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Now this is interesting. Uh, most of the women would have come earlier in the day to draw water, but this woman came later in the day. Why is that? Because she had lived a life of sin. And uh, she wouldn't have wanted to be around the other ladies and wouldn't have come at the same time. She probably was the object of their conversations many times. She had lived a life of sin. And so here she is coming at noon. There's no other women around. Just Jesus at the well. Notice verse 7, Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think Jesus was thirsty? I think He probably was. But Jesus was trying to serve a deeper purpose with asking her for a drink of water. Jesus was using the need of a drink of water to open the conversation to something much more important. And that is living water. Salvation. And so He says to her, Give me a drink. Verse 8, For His disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. They're going to get lunch. Verse 9, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto Him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of Him, he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou this living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. The water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that sense, thou truly. I can imagine this lady's face when Jesus is saying this. He's like, whoa, this guy knows something about me. Verse 19. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. 
Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. The woman saith unto Him, I know that Messiah is cometh, the Messiah which is called Christ, when He is come, He will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am He. Lord, I pray that You'll speak to our hearts through Your Word. Help us to understand that You are always busy in the harvest. That You are always looking for the next soul. That You are always seeking ways to talk to others to help them with their greatest need. And Lord, through Your Word, help us to be more like You this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. The harvest is now. Jesus is talking to this woman at the well. He told her, hey, give me a drink. She said, why are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew. He said, well, if you know who was talking to you, you would have asked me and I'd give you living water. She said, well, how are you going to do that? You don't have anything to draw out with. He said, well, he said, I, I, I'll give you living water and you'll never thirst again. She said, well, I know someday the Messiah is coming. He said, I am the Messiah. I am the Savior. And we find that she believed on Jesus. She gets saved. As a matter of fact, she goes back into her hometown and she says, hey, everybody, come see a man that told me all things ever I did. She went immediately and started witnessing in her hometown to other people. Well, about this time, Jesus is talking to the woman. Look at verse 27. Upon this came His disciples and marveled that He talked with the woman. Now, why did they marvel? One, she was a woman. Two, she was a Samaritan. In those days, men wouldn't just talk with women, and especially not with a Samaritan woman. And here's Jesus talking to her, and the disciples are marveling. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? Then the woman left her water pot, verse 28, and went her way to the city, and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Now in the meanwhile, verse 31, his disciples prayed to him, saying, Master, eat. Remember, this is around lunchtime. The disciples are hungry. They've gone into the town to buy lunch. They got their uncrustables and they got their uh, 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 one of those good little lunchables and they had their lunch ready to go. And they said, Jesus, we're hungry. We're tired. Come on, Jesus, eat something. I mean, I know you're tired. We've been journeying a long time. Get a drink. We bought your food. Time to eat. It's lunchtime. Verse 32, But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. They looked at each other. Did he pack a lunch on his own? Did it, what, what did he bring? Is he holding out on us? We ran into town to get food and he already had food. Verse 33, Therefore they said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him off to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of Him that sent me, and to finish His work. And then He begins to liken the work of God to a harvest. He said, listen, I have a work to do for my Heavenly Father. I don't have time to eat right now because I have a work to do. I'm working in my Father's harvest. And He tells them, verse 35, Say not ye... There are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor, other men labor, and ye are entered into their labors. What is he talking about with a harvest? He said, hey fellas, I don't have time to eat because I'm doing the will of my Father. He said, don't you say there's still four months and then comes harvest? Let's see, four months from now, what is that? That's October. We're usually celebrating some kind of harvest in October. And so, if I may, uh, hey, it's June and harvest isn't until October. But he said, you said harvest is four months from now, but open your eyes, gentlemen. Look around you because the harvest is now. The harvest is right now. They looked around. I don't think they saw fields ready to be harvested. What did they see? They saw people. 
They saw Samaritans coming out of their city because this woman had gone back in saying, Hey, come see a man that told me all things ever I did. They saw Samaritans coming out and flooding towards Jesus. And he said, Gentlemen, lift up your eyes because the harvest is now. I called you not to go pick some wheat out of a field. I called you to go get some souls saved, gentlemen. Man. The harvest is now. Man. It's right now. A lot of Christians are waiting for a better opportunity for a harvest, but can I say to you, number one, the harvest is ready. It's now. Right. It's right now. Say, Pastor, who, who's ready to be saved? Well, here's the thing. We don't know who's ready to be saved. So here's something we need to remember. We should always be looking for the one who's looking for Jesus. I'm looking for the one who's looking for Jesus. You know what that means? It means when I'm out giving out gospel tracts, I might give out a stack of tracts just like this. And I might have most of the people just kind of look at it and go, huh, okay. But guess what? Every once in a while, you know what I'm going to have? If I'm faithful to give these out, if I'm faithful to sow the seed of the Word of God every once in a while, you know what I'm going to have? I'm going to have somebody who says, tell me more about that. I'm going to have somebody every once in a while who says, I, I need a Savior. There are people in this room, you've gotten saved because people in this church led you to Jesus Christ. I'm just curious, in here right now, how many of you have gotten saved in the last five, six, seven years? Let me see, would you raise your hand? Praise the Lord. That somebody came by you and they said, hey, the harvest is right now. There's, there's somebody ready to be saved if we'll just be faithful to work in the harvest. The gospel invitation goes out to many people. And many people don't want it right now, but some people are ready right now to be saved. Say, Pastor, how do I find those people? You get out in God's field, you get busy. Maybe you get a bus route and you go knock on some doors. Maybe as you go to work, you talk to all your co-workers and you give them gospel tracts. Uh, maybe as you uh, 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 go through neighborhoods, you just give tracts out as you pay for your gas, you pay for your food. You know what's going to happen? You're going to find out that the harvest is now. The harvest is ready. Some people aren't ready to be saved the first time they hear the gospel. How many of you got saved the very first time you heard the gospel? Let me see. There could be a good group, but let me see. The very first time. How many of you got saved? I don't see any hands in here. That's usually how it goes. Usually the seed has to be planted. Somebody has to water. And when the time is right, God gives the increase. I've told you the story before about Barry Austin. John Major and I were going door to door, knocking doors over off, off of uh, Eastern, uh, what's the one in Louisville? Eastern Park. We were going door to door. And we were just talking about soul winning and telling folks about Christ and how you get soul winning illustrations. And we knocked on a shotgun style house and we're standing here looking at this door and there's a door right here on the porch. And all of a sudden the door, the, the curtain here moved and it looked like somebody was going like this, like just a minute. So we waited and waited and waited. You know, waiting on someone's porch that you've never been on for three or four minutes kind of awkward. You're sitting there waiting. We thought well, maybe we misunderstood. About that time, the door in front of us opened and there was a man balding, had a wash rag stuffed in his mouth. He was bent over at the waist just like this with his hand on the doorknob. And he motioned for us to come in. We came in, he motioned for us to sit down on the sofa. We sat on the sofa. He went over to a recliner, a, a, a motorized recliner that helps you stand up and sit down. And he slowly lowered himself down. He pulled a little cart up to himself and he had a keyboard and he began to type into that keyboard. And when he did, a robotic voice came out of the computer and it said, Hello, my name is Barry Austin. And we introduced ourselves, what we were doing. We're, we're from such and such a church, going door to door, inviting folks to church. But above all, Barry, we wonder, do you know for sure that someday when you die, you're going to heaven? Barry, are you 100% sure that you'll spend eternity in heaven? Said, no, I don't know that. And of course, he's answering these things, typing them into a computer. It was John Major's turn to talk. He said, can I show you from the Bible how you can know for sure you're saved? You know what John Major did? He took a track similar to this. And he went through the Gospel. He went through verses similar to these and went through the Gospel with Barry Austin. And Barry Austin said, that just seems too simple. Again, all these things are things he typed through his computer. It just seems too simple. You know, Brother Major told him, he said, Barry, the reason it's simple is that Jesus did the hard part for you. Amen. 
Mary, it's simple for us because it's the gift of God. It's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus paid it all for us. All you have to do is by faith receive Him as your, receive him as your Savior. Amen. He motioned for us to go into the bedroom, which was next to the living room. While we're talking, I look over on the TV and I saw a picture of a man, and at that time it was his wife. And here's a man that looked like a businessman, had a, looked like he had the world by the tail, just had control of his life. But I could tell from looking at that man in the picture versus the man I was looking at, it was the same man, but also so very different in many ways. This was a much humbler man. This was a man ready to listen. This was a man who was looking for Jesus. If you had met him six months before or 12 months before, you would have said, that man's not looking for anything. But now he's looking. He motioned for us to go into the bedroom. Brother Major asked, would you like to get saved? And he started weeping again. He had his wash rag stuffed in his mouth. He couldn't control his own bodily functions. He, as he's weeping, he points. He wanted to get down on his knees. By his bed, we get down on our knees. And, and he's weeping and just like this, with that wash rag stuffed in his mouth, we, Brother Major, led him to Jesus Christ. Amen. He got up from his feet as fast as he could. There was a little desk in the bedroom with a computer. And he sat down and he typed out, wow, I'm saved. I can feel the Spirit of God. Lord, thank You for sending Your messengers with Your message to me. Amen. And don't think I wasn't shouting and Amen. carrying on. Man, we were having a glory hallelujah fit. Amen. Do you know how we found out Barry was ready? We asked him. We asked him. You know what we, what we tend to do is we profile. We go, well, God, I know you want me to win souls to you, and I know I should witness to my coworkers. I know I should witness to my neighbors, but they probably don't want to hear. Listen, you won't know until you ask. That's right. You won't know. What do we need to do? We need to be faithful just to speak to everybody we can about Jesus Christ. Why did Jesus say, hey, I'm thirsty, give me a drink? Was that all He was interested in, was getting a drink of water? No. He was using something of felt need. He was using some day-to-day -day happening, some day-to-day -day event to point this woman to Himself and to eternal life. Amen. Folks, the harvest is now. God is going to bring people across your path. Even today as you're driving home from church, maybe as you stop at the gas station or you stop to get some food or you go home and your neighbor's in the yard, there's going to be somebody that God wants you to speak to. The question is, is your heart in tune? Are you ready? The harvest is ready. The harvest is now. Be looking for the one who's looking for Jesus. Jesus said, verse 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. There are souls that need to be saved if we'll reach them. Folks, there's a reason why as a church, we don't want to just sit and get comfortable. Listen, God didn't move us from folding, uh, folding metal chairs in a, uh, a fellowship hall to some padded pews so we could just sit back and relax and get comfortable. God moved us here and gave us more space so we can fill it up for God's glory. God moved us here so we can win souls to Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, we've already got two buses and uh, I, don't, I don't think we have room for a third. No, but you know what we need to do by faith? By faith, God's touching someone's heart in here to say, you know what, I can be a Sunday school teacher. Hey, I can be a bus worker. I can be a bus captain. And by faith, we need to pray about God increasing our efforts in His field. You know what those buses are? They're tractors in God's harvest. That's what they are. And the harvest is now. There are people who need to be saved now. There are neighborhoods all around us that need a bus and a bus captain and a church right now. The harvest is ready. I want you to see, secondly, the reapers receive rewards. Look at verse 36. And he that reapeth receiveth wages. God rewards his servants. He will reward you for your work in his harvest. Say, Pastor, I'm part of this church. That's a wonderful thing. But I want to ask you personally, what are you doing personally to get the gospel to someone? What are you doing personally? Who are you handing a gospel tract to? Who are you giving your testimony to? Who are you asking about their soul? God will reward His servants. Look at Revelation 22, the very last chapter of the Bible. Revelation 22, verse 12. Listen to what Jesus says, Revelation 22, 12. He says, And behold, I come 
quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. God will reward His servants and He'll get it right. And He'll reward you according to your labor in His harvest. Amen. Folks, let me remind you again. What's Jesus doing? He said, I came to do the will of my Father. He said, Jesus, eat some lunch. Here's your Uncrustables. Here's your Lunchables. Eat something, Jesus. He said, no, I have meat to eat. You know what I know. Well, what, did anybody give Him food? He said, my meat is to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish His work. Well, what kind of work was He doing? He was soul winning. He was pointing folks to Jesus Christ. What kind of work did God leave us here to do? He left us here to win souls. Amen. Folks, people say, I, I, we ought to come to church to worship. We should. We should worship God. Uh, by the way, people say, I can worship God anywhere. You're right, and you should. You should worship God anywhere. I was out in Michigan sitting with my parents uh, on their little porch swing and watching some birds come in, some hummingbirds and some wood, woodpeckers. You know who I was giving praise and glory and who I was worshiping? The Lord. The Creator. I said, wow, isn't this amazing? God made these beautiful things. Folks, we should worship God everywhere. Why did God leave us here? Aren't we going to worship Him in heaven? We sure are. But why did He leave us here? If His whole intent was for us to worship Him, why didn't He just take us on to heaven? Because there are souls that need to be saved here. And He's given us the job of getting out in His field and laboring for souls. The harvest is now. The harvest is ready. And the reapers receive rewards. Look back in John 4, verse 36. He that reapeth receiveth wages. Number three, the rewards God gives are eternal. Look at verse 36. He that receiveth, reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. Let me ask you this question. Are you really making a difference in eternity? Look at Matthew 6. Some of you young people, you're going to go back to a public school this year. By the way, Lord willing, eventually God will give us a Christian school. And uh, we, we want to see many of you in that school. But you go back to that public school, you have an opportunity to take a stand for Jesus Christ. You have an opportunity to speak up for Him. Are you making your life count for eternity? Or is your, is your life only counting in the stuff here that matters here? You know, the man who, who stores away gold, he's, he's storing away that which is pavement in heaven. Look at Matthew 6, 19. Jesus says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. Is it wrong to have something nice that you enjoy? No, God gave it to you. Enjoy it. But if that's all your life's about, yes, that's wrong. And you're wasting your life, Christian. Verse 20, he says, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Well, what kind of treasure can you lay up in heaven? I mean, can you send dollar bills ahead? Can you send gold bricks? Do they need any more pavement in heaven? No. There's really only one treasure you can send to heaven. Souls. People. Eternal souls that are going to live forever either in heaven or hell. Folks, let's be invested in the salvation of lost souls. I know we are as a church. I know that. That we wouldn't be able to run buses if our church wasn't invested in that. But I'm asking you personally, what are you doing in God's Field. What are you doing in God's harvest? What rewards are you going to have because of your efforts to get people saved? Folks, we all ought to be doing something to get someone else saved. All of us. Say, Pastor, I'm not, I'm not an extrovert. I'm not either. I'm not an introvert. I'm somewhere in between. I know I asked this before. I'll ask again. How many of you are extroverts? Let me see. How many of you are introverts? I didn't think you'd raise your hand. <laughs> and how many of you are somewhere in between? Most of us are somewhere in between. Listen, you know what? Do what you can. Do whatever you have to do to get the gospel out. I don't, man, I go to some of these teenagers. I love it. They'll, we'll go to Lowe's to buy something for church. You know what they do? They t stick a track on every paint can in that store. Well, not really, but it you know, seems that way. And I know ladies who go to Goodwill. How many ladies go to Goodwill? I mean, that's a good place. I go to Goodwill. They'll take gospel tracks and stick them in shirt pockets and in shoes. Say, well, that's not a bold witness. That's better than nothing. Man, if, if, I'm, if I'm a runner, I'm not. But if I were, and I can't run a marathon, if I can run a 50-yard dash, I'm, I'm going to run my 50-yard dash. I'm going to do what I can do. 
in the harvest. By the way, maybe maybe God would give you the courage to speak up now and go, you know what, hey, can I talk to you about something? And maybe you're talking sports with your buddies at work and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just pricks your heart and you know. You know you need to bring up Jesus Christ. Right, man. You know what you do? You say, hey guys, man, I love my team. You talk about your team. Can I tell you something? Well, God just really wants me to tell you about the most important decision I ever made, about the most important person I ever met. Can I just take you a couple minutes to tell you about it? Jesus Christ. Say, Pastor, I don't know how to witness. Do you know how you got saved? Right. Then you know how to witness. Right. One of the most effective ways I've ever seen in soul winning is taking a gospel track just like this and going, here, you take one. Here, I'll take one. Oh, I know it doesn't seem real professional or formal, but it works. Here, you take one of these, I'll take one of these. Let me read this to you. Will you read along with me? Do what you can do. Find a way to labor in God's harvest. The harvest is ready. The harvest is now. The reapers do receive rewards. By the way, you may have family that's lost. Pray. Fast and pray for them. And do whatever you can to get the gospel to them. The rewards are eternal. Number four, the laborers rejoice together. Look at 1 Corinthians, please. Chapter 3, the laborers rejoice together. In verse 36, Jesus said, He that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. When the Bible says sow, it's not talking about needle and thread. It, it, it was fun. I don't think she's here today. But God bless her. I love Miss Rose. We, we had a, I was talking about a soul winning class. She said, Pastor, she came to me. She goes, I have some needles, I have some threads. I can give for the soul winning class. Soul winning class. No, Miss Rose, I'm talking about soul winning. <laughs> when the Bible says sowing, it's not talking about needle and thread. It's talking about like a farmer planting seed. <laughs> planting seed. When it says sow, it's talking about taking the Word of God and planting seed. You know when I go to McDonald's and buy a biscuit and hand it a track, you know what I'm doing? I'm planting seed. Man. I don't know if it'll grow or not, but I'm going to plant some seed. And maybe actually I'm watering the seed somebody else already planted. I don't know. But notice what Jesus said. He said, The laborers, he that soweth and he that reapeth, may rejoice together. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Here's what I want to say about this. In 1 Corinthians 3, the church there, they were bickering and fighting over who led them to the Lord. Some people said, Well, I got saved under Apollos. So, so we're right. Somebody said, Well, I got saved because of Peter. Somebody else said, I got saved because of Paul. Paul said, You're all carnal. He said, you know, the fact is we all got saved because of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Verse 7, So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Hey, be careful in a church or even among other good Bible-preaching, Bible-believing churches, be careful about developing a spirit of competition. Be careful. Instead, develop a spirit of teamwork. Amen. You know what's going to happen in heaven? First of all, again, he that soweth, he that watereth, we're nothing. Right. We get rewarded for our labor, but we're nothing. Amen. Jesus Christ is everything. Amen. So if I hear some brother getting somebody else saved, you know what I'm going to say? Praise God. Amen. If I hear somebody in this church, I meet my soul winning, and I got to lead one person to Christ, and somebody else got to lead three people to Christ, you know what I'm going to say? Praise God. Amen. You got three saved? Thank God. Amen. Why? I'm going to get rewarded for my labor. I'm not anything. This brother's not anything. Jesus Christ is everything. And you know what we're going to do in heaven? We're going to rejoice together. Amen. We're going to rejoice together. Amen. We're going to see somebody that got saved. You know, man, I remember the first time I knocked on their door and they told me to get off their porch. Yeah. So really, you, they did that to you? Man, they came to our church and got saved. <laughs> wow. So I guess I was sowing the seed and you were watering and God gave the increase. Amen. You know, be careful. Bus workers, bus teams, you have one person go by a door, they'll knock on the door. They don't want to hear anything that person has to say. The next person comes and they get saved. They come to church and they're faithful. What is it? Was one bus worker better than another? No, I'm going to tell you what it was. One sowed, one watered. God gave the increase. Amen. Don't have a spirit of competition or of envy against another brother or sister in Christ. Have a spirit of teamwork saying, let's get as many people saved as we can. Last of all, I want you to see this. The Lord of the harvest is the one 
who gives the increase. In John 4, Jesus said, Herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored and ye are entered into their labors. I think of Ananiah and Judson who went to Burma and for seven years, as long as our church has been here, for seven years, he faithfully preached the Gospel. You know how many people got saved? Zero. Zero. Well, if Adam and Judson was right with God, no, he was right with God. He was doing what God told him to do. He was plowing up some ground. He was planting some seeds. Guess what? After those seven years, though, the water gates, the, 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 the floodgates broke open. The fact is this. The Word of God is like a seed. It takes time. It takes time. You just be faithful to plant you be faithful to water, God will give the increase. Look back there in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 7 again. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now, he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are laborers together. What are the next two words? God. With God. You see Jesus soul winning to that woman at the well? You know what you're doing when you're soul winning? You're laboring together with God. There's nothing more important than the heart of God. Nothing. It's what Jesus did when He was here. He was doing the work of His Father. He was winning folks to Himself. When you go soul winning, when you give a gospel track, you're laboring with God. Verse 9, we are laborers together with God. We are God's husbandry. We are God's doing. When people get saved, it's all God's doing. He's the one who gives the increase. I've told you before, I'll be done with this. And I, I like to tell this story because I want to encourage you to know that every time you give out a gospel tract, every time you say something for Jesus Christ, you're making a difference whether you realize it or not. Right. Whether you feel like a powerful Christian or not, you're making a difference. God gives the increase. You just be faithful to give the Word. You be faithful to witness to others and God will give the increase. I've told you the story before about Robin, the manager at Unique Thrift. I mean, you know where Unique Thrift is. It used to be one in Portland. I lived there about two or three days a week. I would go there a couple times. We'd find stuff there. Sometimes sell it on Craigslist, get suits, you know, stuff like that there. Well, as my habit is, I'd go in there, whether I felt like it or not. If I saw a person there, I'd give them a gospel track. One day I was in the store, I gave someone a gospel track. The manager, Robin, came up to me and she said, We don't do that here. She said, You're not allowed to do this in the store. Okay. Second time I came in, I gave somebody else a gospel track. I wasn't trying to, oh, I didn't go to Rob and say, hey, Robin, hey, look, here. I didn't do that. I just kind of, you know, hoped she didn't see, gave but she did. She said, she must have been watching. She came up to me, she said, I told you before, we don't do that in the store. You're not allowed to do that here. Third time, I'm checking out. Now I'm paying for something. Or crying out loud, I'm giving money to your place. I pulled out a gospel track, went to give it, and Robin's up there and she said, I told you before, and I'm going to tell you again, if I see you do this again, I'm going to call the cops on you. Well, I felt led not to go back to Unique Thrift. So I didn't go back to Unique Thrift. A few years passed. I wish I could tell you, I was afraid. I just went out in the parking lot and started street preaching, but I didn't. A few years passed, I was coming home from work in Indiana. And I was tired, sweaty, dirty, in mire. And you know how you get when you don't, when you're just tired, you don't want to talk to somebody. Don't act like you're not that way. <laughs> don't act like you didn't see him. <laughs> Move to the lines. I think we're here. You can hear a whisper. And that's the greatest thing on a bus ride. You go to the, the kid comes to the door and says, My parents told me to tell you they're not here. <laughs> okay, well, you tell your parents that uh, I'll see them next time when they are here. Here she came up the main aisle, that grocery aisle. Meyer, I'm coming from the back of the store towards the front. She's coming from the front towards the back. I saw her. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I wasn't being courageous. You know what I did? I went and I tried to dart into an aisle, but she saw me. And here she came. Well, now you can't ignore them. They're coming right at you. She came right at me. She said, first thing she asked, Are you that guy? She didn't call him track. She said something like, Are you that guy that used to give out those papers about Jesus? I'm thinking, How do I want to answer this? 
Because the last time she saw me, she said, I'm going to call the cops on you. I went, yeah, that's me. You know what she said? I just want to thank you. Me? <laughs> I'm thanking you. She said, I just want to thank you. Because a couple of years later, I got saved. Right. And now I tell others about Jesus. I wonder where I can find some of those to give to people. Was I being a bold, brave, courageous Christian? No, I was just trying to stay faithful in the harvest. Just trying to plant a little more seed, water a little more seed. I wasn't being anything, but God gave me increase. Amen. Christian, the harvest is now. We've got to get busy in the field. 